And yeah, big thank you again to our three uh, panellists for joining us this morning, particularly to Jonathan and Abigail. Uh, so the first question I'd love to start with is something I'd love to hear from each of you on. Uh, each of your business founders, so I'd love to hear why is building an organisation with purpose important to you personally? I might start with you, Abigail, <laughs> just to put you on the spot. Oh, well, I don't know how I'd do it any other way. Like, so I think most businesses, well, I hope, start with solving a problem. So it was a problem that I saw in the business I was in beforehand, wanted to solve it, and actually building a business was just a byproduct of solving that problem. Yeah, terrific. There's actually a quote from you that I really loved, and I thought it captured this topic really well, which is, uh, we see ourselves as a campaign supported mm. by a product. Yeah. Is that a, a message that you echo internally as well as externally? I think so. I mean, I guess the challenge for us right now is that for 10 years, we were sort of out on the, um, you know, the cutting edge, pushing for um, the fact that disposable cups weren't recyclable. Mm. A lot of people now know that and it's now not, will I use a reusable cup, it's which reusable. So I guess we're really trying to reframe who we are as an organisation because being just a product company is pretty boring and, mm. and perhaps, you know, we're starting to become part of, not part of the solution anymore, we're just another thing that you can buy. So, you know, we're, we're looking at how we can get on the, the, mm. the front of the conversation again. Yeah, terrific. Any thoughts, Jonathan? What about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm... I, Similarly, don't have a choice. I'm sort of addicted. <laughs> I'm addicted to the drug of um, doing cool stuff. And luckily, I've been able to work with, over the last 10 years, um, some amazing people and some amazing purpose-led businesses, some which didn't know themselves as purpose-led businesses mm -hmm. as, they, as, you know, as they stepped into it. Um, and because I'm sort of involved in that branding cycle, I guess I've been indoctrinated um, you know, really about what it's like to be so invested in what you're doing that you don't know the difference between work and life mm. and that you don't. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's been the biggest reward for me in the work that I do. And I think um, it's probably shaped the last 10 years of my life. Yeah, definitely. So the melding of the boundaries between work and life. And that's something, Dylan, you're pretty familiar with? Yeah, I mean, obviously it was a bit central to our, our, um, our branding. I remember the conversation I was, we were sitting with um, the team and, and Jonathan and Justine talking about that. And, you know, I guess it goes to this bigger concept around you know, systems, we sort of have these um, perhaps um, pretend um, barriers or we try to put barriers in place that separate um, work and life, but really um, they, they are all the same and perhaps similar to, to Justine's concept around the, um, the panarchy principle, which wasn't a, isn't a principle I know of or have used before, but, yeah, it does seem similar to you, Abigail, to me quite incomprehensible that you would, um, you would have a, an organisation that perhaps... Um, would have a, a single focus on something that um, seems so non-systemic without using, you know, theoretical words, but it, it doesn't really reflect the world in which we live in, which are made of customers and, and communities and you know, peoples and needs. And we see this conversation happening at the moment in organisations and business, but we see it at a bigger level in climate change and those sort of things, you know, the, the sort of you know, the, the total connection between the environment we work in and, the, and, and live in and the, the need to keep customers, um, to work with customers, but also to manage business and profits. There's a, a really unique balance. So it just feels um, like a natural integration um, for me and perhaps that came through in our brand a little bit. So Yeah, terrific. Mm. So a theme that emerged through the case study is this idea of alignment between purpose, brand and culture. I'd be keen to hear what's the clearest example of alignment that you've come across in your experience. And I might start with you, Jonathan. Uh, I mean, this, first, let's clap it up for Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> from, a Melbourne, from a Melbourne idea to um, someone who can, um, you know, transform um, a, a product category and invent a product category, it would be remiss to sort of um, to ignore that one. Um, uh, probably a, a, a second example and, and one that, um, you know, that's really interesting to me at the moment is um, a business called Zooks, which I'm not sure if um, people might be familiar with. Um, it's a phenomenal story that's sort of um, breaking now. Um, a Melbourne, uh, a Melbourne person, um, uh, founder who, who's looking to build the next, um, the next vehicle after the car, effectively. So sort of gone from the driverless car to what comes after the driverless car. Um, and I think uh, what I've seen from seeing the inside of that business um, and seeing the courage that it's needed, the business now has a valuation of uh, four billion dollars, I think, as of last week. Um, and really, it's 
there's no product, there's no consumer, there's just a really bold vision. And there's now hundreds of people um, in an office in San Francisco following, chasing this dream, um, very much of, of, of two people at the core of it. Um, and, you know, I, I think that spirit, and, and again, I sort of, I, I would replay that as a, um, a, a take two of the similar story of a keep cup and that passion of the founder. Mm. Um, when that works and when people see genuine leadership, um, all of the other sort of, um, the bullshit, I guess, falls away mm. and passion, human desire to achieve something yeah. um, really shines through. And I think that's the, that authentic moment of human truth mm. that you can't fake when you're a leader. You can't, you can't fake it when you're really passionate about something. Mm. Um, yeah, seeing that in, uh, in Keep Cup and in Dukes uh, more, more sort of recently is really exciting. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Obviously, Keep Cup is coming up as a really good example, uh, nice Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> was there any models that you looked at or other organisations that were sort of an inspiration to you at the outset? Uh, yeah, this, I mean, start. we looked at... The things we looked at was we looked at Swatch and saw that they brought fun and colour and fashion to the stodgy old watch. We looked at... I mean, I've always loved Aesop and the sort of... Um, the integrity of, of the brand and how it speaks and, and what it says. It's, I mean, there's a lot of copycats now, but, you know, 10 years ago it was, it was pretty visionary in what it did. Um, and we looked at SIG. So they'd been making water bottles since 1905... And so, you, you know, when we first started Keep Cup, people said, how can you have a business that's got one product? And we looked to them and said, well, SIG's been doing it for 100 years. So, yeah. But then I, I guess the other one is, is Tesla and how it brought, um, you know, a passion for cars but actually was pushing a sustainable future and how uh, not only has he made the car, he's got the roof tiles and the batteries and, and really just transformed an industry and so that all the rest of the car companies are compelled to follow now and... Uh, yeah, it's the electric car, so... Yeah, terrific, terrific. So we've touched on some good examples. Um, I'd be keen to hear a little bit about what are some of the barriers that you might have uh, overcome in your journey to becoming an aligned organisation? Oh, the barriers we've overcome. I guess, I mean, to me, businesses are the... the uh, I, I did a talk a little while ago with um, a guy from Unilever and he said that um, Unilever was started by Lord Lever because people were dying of cholera and he made soap. Um, and that's how that business started, to try and prevent the spread of cholera. And now it's this huge organisation. So I think um, it's how businesses respond to change and, and um, that, that is the main thing that keeps a business with integrity and authenticity, how you pivot when, when change happens externally to what you're trying to do. Yeah, terrific. I've seen some bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> Please share. <laughs> yeah. I must anonymise as a as a professional consultant, but having been on the inside of um, branding projects, and branding projects happen for exciting reasons, like changes in business, um, you also get brought in when things go bad. Mm. Um, and I think, to me, if you boil it down, there's fundamentally two things that people inside of the, the brand and purpose space need to understand. And it's being able to, to understand the macro and the micro. Mm. And, and, and um, where, these, where I've seen it go horribly wrong is people buy in, t and, and you can buy into the, to the corporate slide deck, and the ideas can make total sense when you, <laughs> when you think about it. Um, but when, when people step in and then they go, OK, yeah, that, that's our purpose, let's get back to work. Um, and, and we've seen that happen um, uh, you know, financial services organisations where um, there's effectively, um, and I won't name the company obviously, but um, you know, a big transition was happening in the business. Um, there was a, a need for a rev up. There was a really strong marketing campaign around mm. this new purpose. And, and effectively it was visible from everyone except the people who, who were sort of leading that change that it was inauthentic. Mm. And it was a, it was a marketing campaign to our own people. And I think, um, you know, when we, see, when we saw how that rippled out and when we saw the sort of, you know, um, I guess just the degre degradation of value that happens mm. when you lie to your own people. Um, and, and I realistically, the people wanted to make money. There was a fundamental, they were kind of old school um, bankers and they wanted to make money. And, um, you know, when they put a, put a face on and they started to try and tell everyone that they've changed and it was inauthentic, um, it just was. A, it was actually far worse than having just stood up the front and saying, "Yeah, we want to make money, and we will we'll look after you guys." Mm, <laughs> yeah. Mm. And so I think there's, yeah, honesty and integrity are, are critical. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dylan, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, 
I think one of the I think the question you asked, Chris, was something around you know when does it go wrong, and you know that might be an example um, there, Jonathan. I think one of the things that I I see, and you know, one of the privileges I get in my job is to work with lots and lots of different companies, and perhaps um, over time you're sort of like you're on a balcony seeing things happen. Um, I think perhaps in that example, Jonathan, you talked about it's that sort of concept that there's often mutual exclusivity exclusivity of goals that profit and customer sometimes struggle to sort of be housed in the same conversation or that um, or that change and adaptability and you know I'm, I'll go to micro level process um, um, uh, can't be reconciled together and I think that that black and white conversation as opposed to the end conversation is one that can be difficult to reconcile but is really the point that value is created for organisations, you know? So obviously we talk about how does purpose sit underneath all that, but there's constant struggle within, I use that term again, system. I know it's a little bit of a, perhaps an overused term, but it looks at the fact that we can't look at one, one component part of it and there's always this end conversation. So, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, there's some of the, the challenges I see day to day and, we're, and also some of the great opportunities I see where organisations truly embrace the, the end concept, and it may be a really good industry rather than an organisation. I talk about an industry of sort of safety culture. I don't know how many people in here have, you know, have sort of lived in the world of, of sort of um, trying to improve safety outcomes in organisations. But, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, we just accepted that it was a cost of business that people would die at work. We just accepted that that would be the case. And, and so over the last 20 or 30 years, really since Chernobyl happened, we go, actually, you know what? Maybe that's not good enough, and maybe we need to think hard about it. Maybe there's an and. How do we produce stuff, um, whether it's energy or or cars or um, you know in the mining sector? How do we do that? And how do we do we protect our people and think about the communities in which we live in? Now, I'm not saying all of those industries I flagged um, um, have it right. Um, in fact, <laughs> some funny uh, funny story to tell from some of my googling last night when I thought I'd better do a bit of thinking and research, perhaps I'll get to that in a moment, but they haven't all got it right, but organisations who can embrace the, the and feels like a really important point, and I, I feel that as a business owner, you know, this is sustainability, you need, to, um, you need to be sustainable and that means a level of profitability and I'm, I'm sure both Abigail and Jonathan feel that, you know, that's a, a ticket to go, but it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an end outcome or it's mm. not the purpose. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, the interesting thing, and, and looking at Nike as an example, um, the, the interesting thing for me is that if you have a direct, if you've got an ear to your consumer, and if you've got, if you're listening to your consumer um, or your user, if that's a closed loop, it's funny how many things, how many of your problems fall away and how much your purpose actually bubbles to the surface. Mm. And I think that's one of the, you know, um, you know, knowing a little bit about Nike, one of the phenomenal reasons that... Um, it's, I, I mean, they're not um, they're not there because they're, they're they're sort of moral leaders per se. They're there because they listen to people, mm. and and really, there's a lot of voices and a lot of common sense that's coming out of the general public right now. And if you listen, so many of these, you know, safety is one of those issues. If you listen, if you listen to what people say, you can pick up 99% of problems could be picked up just by asking some questions. Mm. And when you've got that data loop. Um, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of bad press about data, but um, data might ruin our lives, but it also might save them. Mm. <laughs> and I think, you know, anyway, anytime you've got that closed data loop, um, you know, you can solve a lot of things. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, I think it, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was funny. I, um, last night I was saying when I, I thought, I'd better put my, my thinking cap on for today, you know, this is, um, this is our, our gig and I, I, um, one of the things, I've walked into a couple of foyers of large organisations and, and um, one of them was a mining um, organisation we're going to do some work with and on their, uh, on their wall was their mission statement and it was to enhance shareholder profit. That, that, that was their mission statement and that really, um, yeah, really... Um, really pained with me. I was oh my God, like, you know, and I was like, yeah, do we still have organisations talking like that? We understand that that's a, um, an, an outcome perhaps of doing really good work. But when I, I thought, oh, I'll have a Google and see if many, um, if many good thinkers have really commented on that topic. And when I Googled, I just found hundreds of mission statements of current organisations right now just saying that is our purpose. And so, you know, then, you know, it's sort of like Drucker's stuff 
50, 1954 or whatever was really about going, our job is to create, is to create, um, create clients, to create clients. And, you know, that's, that's a long time ago, that's 70 years ago, um, as opposed to thinking about the, the outcome of doing that, which is what you talked to Jonathan a bit. Which, I mean, I, I, I oversimplify this and I look at the world and say there's effectively, um, there's three types of, of businesses. There are legacy businesses. So there's businesses whose survival is contingent on some form of legacy, whether that's being, um, you know, a legacy business or an emerging industry, uh, uh, sorry, an um, established industry. Um, there's emergent businesses, so technology businesses and innovative businesses. And then there's businesses in the middle, which are legacy businesses that are moving into being emerging businesses. Now, if you're a legacy business, by definition, you are in preservation mode. You're under attack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to, to sympathise with the shareholders or with the board who are in that situation, all these things which are happening, all these disruptions, are effectively eroding. You know, the, the good old days were better, if we simplify this. <laughs> if you're in an emerging business, you're looking at every business who's, in, who's hunkering down and you're looking at how you can sort of take some of the market share from one of those legacy businesses. And then if you're in the middle, which is the vast majority of businesses on the ASX <laughs> 200, you're some form of, um, you know, you, you're in some combination of looking going, are we preserving our shareholder value? Are we stuck in this mindset? Are we buckling down? Is this all a tax? Or are we flipping and are we being innovators and are we changing the way we work and are we flipping our teams to being innovation teams and are we, are we going to be like a, a, essentially reinvent ourselves as a startup? And, you know, the thing that I see in business is that's hugely challenging. If, if you can have that macro view, it's hugely challenging for anyone to work out, well, what do you do tomorrow? Mm. Uh, like, what's the action you take into work? And I think... You know, this is the, the great question of leadership now is that, and, and clearly there are great stories of emergent businesses who are doing it all right. The, the question I think which is more complex is what do you do if you're in that transition phase? What, what is preservation? What is, what is actually preserving the value of, of what you stand for? But then where can you flex? Where can you adapt? You know, where can you um, take on a broader value set that, that um, and, and how can you do that without sort of eroding effectively, um, you know, what got you to where you were. Mm -hmm. Mm. How do you see it? I mean, I, I'm interested, Abigail, obviously you, you're... <laughs> you should have passed it over to me, I swear. No, no, I was thinking more about, I mean, the, the thing, thing is, companies are legally there just to make money. That is their only obligation is to their shareholders. And, you know, I see these conversations about purpose and very... Very fortunately, Keep Cup is, in, is a new business, so we're on the, the right side of history at the moment. But, you know, the war on plastic waste, plastic was initially an environmental solution because it stopped people using bone. Uh, so, you know, things uh, keep on changing. And, um, yeah, with purpose, I don't really see the difference between value statement, purpose statement, mission statement. It's just a new skin on an old idea. And what I do think it is trying to do is put ethics uh, into business, but it's, it, it can't. Like, it's, it's struggling to do that. And I think that, um, I mean, B Corporation and, and there's people like that who are trying to embed um, more uh, responsibility on companies to look after environment, to look after community, and I think there's more work to be done there. And I don't think purpose statements and values alignment are going to do it. There needs to be something that's embedded in the structure of, of how we... Um, organises a community and, and businesses. But, but I'd be interested, I mean, we've got a, um, a mature audience. I'd be interested in a quick show of, and I say that from us, there's a lot of senior um, leaders and so on in the audience. Um, I, I'd be interested, I don't know if you can do it, an um, anonymous show of hands, can you? Um, but I'd be interested if we could have a quick show of hands who, of, of people who are in this crowd who knows or clearly understands the purpose of the business that they work in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that I would say is um, having done um, audits within businesses on brand purpose, that's a phenomenally high share of hands. I'd call that about mm. 55, 60%. Um, 
But when you think, you know, when you think that from the average amount, you know, I would say that if you surveyed it probably um, numerically, it's, it may be 15 to 20% mm. in the average business could say what the purpose of their business is. Yeah. So I, like, I think, yeah, one of the things I've, I found this week, I think I mentioned it in my opening, was that um, obviously the topic struck a, a chord um, with a lot of folk, but I, I really resonated with um, a part of that case study because, I, you know, I, was, I, I always hate getting asked that question around what, what companies doing amazingly in this? Because it's really hard. Like it's really, it's really difficult. I mean, you talked about Abigail about things are constantly changing, and I talked about this concept of sort of and and you know trying to balance balance tensions. So, you know, I think, you know, I think there are many organisations, no doubt, of, of that people represent in the room, and certainly that people came up to me in the week and said, "Wow, I'm struggling with this," and it might be that their purpose was really crystal clear, but they were having aberrations at the front line because it wasn't getting getting down. And so I think, yeah, it's, um, you know, even, and even if I think about some of the amazing clients I've worked with, um, it's hard to name any that get it right all the time. They don't. It's a constant a constant balance. And I really liked uh, in that case study of Nike around the fact that it's a it's sort of like a, a pendulum. You're constantly trying to rebalance and, and find alignment at the front line. And it definitely won't work all the time, but the, the pursuit of trying to to have a, a purpose that is about a customer and is about um, doing something good and about ethical leadership. You know, your role um, is obviously about you know, trying to find clients and meet those needs, but there's also something around stewardship of the, you know, the environment and the world that we live in as well. And you go, how do I balance those things? But I'm also trying to balance current value creation in our business and, and what, you know, what... 10 or 15 or 20 years might look like. So it's a, it's a real balance, but I, I really admire organisations who are trying to iterate towards that, you know. Absolutely. And I think we need to have some, you know, we, we can't be too hard on ourselves ultimately. And, and I think, <laughs> you know, I, but I think it's about taking steps in the right direction. So I think when you've got a cup that, that um, an amazing um, product, which, you know, by definition removes waste out of, uh, out of the, the environment, it's clearly fantastic. When you're delivering more complex financial services or you've got a more complex business model, it's very hard to align everyone around that singular vision. You know, if we're inventing the, new, um, the, the next car, everyone gathers in a circle and goes, cool, I'm gonna listen to the person up the front because I've got no idea how to do it and I'm going on this journey. When you've got complex services that have different market segments, you know, I think how, how you really, and again, um, it, it's not just about what's in the PowerPoint, deck, how you really get people to feel like they're on one journey to do one, you know, to, to really deliver that and mm. how you connect that to the community. Mm. It, you know, it, there's, there's, there's some, um, you know, some fantastic work that's going on in that space, but it is challenging. Do, do you find, you know, and I don't know how you found this, Abigail or, or, or Jonathan, but do you find that it's, and certainly, Jonathan, you would see this a lot as a consultant in this space, do you find that that connect, that, that purpose is often there, but you just have to work to find it because that was my reflection when I walked into this company and I saw they do great work. Yeah, they're a mining company and they have they're, they're, there's some there's some things there that that need to be kept in check. They do great work, but they just hadn't done the work to yep. to go what what is it that we're doing that's good and how do I how do we connect to our people into the community in the right way. I just felt that was a massive missed opportunity and it really, as I said, it really grated with me because I go, geez, I, I couldn't get out of bed for that, but but I'm sure there's actually real substance in that organisation. Do you find that? that... Absolutely. I mean, mm. I, 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 you know, having said that a, a small percentage of people inside of businesses understand their purpose, I don't think there's many people who don't come to work and think about this. And you'll find, you know, invariably when you speak with leadership teams, that exact, exact thing, no one wants to actually be the one that writes it mm. or that puts the five words on the slide and stands there and goes, hey, look, I've done it. Because you've sort of got a target on your back, you know? There's a lot of pressure <laughs> in getting this thing wrong. Um, but, but I think that there's actually, you know, the tools that we have now, and I'm seeing this increasingly, to survey your staff, to capture, um, to capture feedback, you can discover that purpose, I think, um, you know, within your core mm. very easily. And, um, but as a new emerging field, you know, what's the process? Am I doing it right? There's, there is no sort of, you know, there's no app that you download that sort of works this stuff out. And, and you know, let's be honest, in, in terms of some of, the, um, some of the age of senior leadership in large companies, they've been doing it the old way for a fair while. So there's a lot of, this, a lot of these ideas which are quite foreign to them. Mm. 
And, oh, yeah, I guess I need to high-five back to you now, John, because we've just done a whole um, re-look at our brand and our strategy, so 10 years in, and really it was about... I think we all knew what our purpose was, what the brand was about, but um, it was really about South South West taking the, the, the knife to a few of our... <laughs> we are carrying a lot of baggage. Every single thing we'd ever said, we were still saying, so it was about simplifying that down to what... distilling what, what we'd been doing. And I think sometimes you need an external party to help you do that because mm. you're in, in the thick of it. But, I mean, I'd really say having seen, um, having seen that process, you know, play out many times with some of the biggest brands and, and some emerging brands, I think the more that people can um, take on the collective responsibility for brand, like within corporations, um, you know, we, we, tend to, we tend to compartmentalise who deals with what and there's rightfully brand teams and there's marketing teams and there's production teams. Um, but I think at a cultural level, we need to encourage that everyone is engaged with the brand. Mm. And I think the minute we compartmentalise it and sort of say, well, you take care of the brand and you take care of the operations, um, you know, there's a, there's a real challenge for sustaining that brand. Yeah. Mm. And I think when you look at an organisation and dealing with, um, uh, you know, with a, an organisation like Nike, they, people are so passionate about that. And that... I get it. There's a bit of an Australian thing, right? Like we Australians don't <laughs> Australians don't wear their logo on their uh, you know on their on their sleeve quite as passionately, um, but certainly in organisations like Nike, when employees climb into that, that's what they live and breathe. Mm. Like they they would die for that brand, um, and I think um, there's some of that 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 passion and that inspiring that passion and rewarding that passion needs to be part of modern business. Mm. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I might just interject with a final question here from me, as I'd love to get an opportunity for everyone out here to throw out some questions to you all. Um, but just lastly, what's the greatest example of shared value that you've seen created based on the alignment of purpose, brand and culture? Just a small question to finish off with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really going to answer the question, but so one of the examples I've got is that... Um, we uh, make keep cups in Australia and when we got to a certain level we wanted to have local manufacture all over the world and we got to a point in the UK where we had enough volume that we could locally manufacture in the UK and that was always part of the vision of the business and when I went around and got quotes um, from different companies in the UK it turned out that we could ship the cups from Australia to the UK cheaper than we could make them in the UK and um, have them done and so you know, the commercial part of my brain kicked in. I said to the team, we can't, we can't do it. It doesn't make commercial sense. And one of the um, people who'd been working um, with me for 20 years said, well, if you stand, if, if, this, if our values are true, we're about local manufacture, you, you have to do it. You have to do it and just make it work. And I think that's, that's um, an important way that values should work in an organisation, that you can be held to account internally for your values, and then that if you go ahead and do it, you know, and it did, we did it, and it did turn out really well in the end. Like the idea was that um, the UK consumers would recognise that and value that, so you would get um, growth um, over the uh, the margin, which which turned out to be the case. Um, I, I guess the one I want to, and I, I keep having to put um, client disclaimers on things, but another <laughs> business which I've been fortunate to see the inside of um, is Tesla. And um, obviously topical, there's a lot of um, Elon and his um, twitching thumb. <laughs> there's, there's caused a lot of, um, you know, bad press in over the last couple of weeks. Um, and knowing his personality type probably will continue to, to, to you know, be topical. Um, but I think uh, having seen the way, and, and I can certainly relate to it, the, the um, dogmatic um, belief in, in changing the way that the, that, um, the energy source of vehicles and having seen that as a founding kind of core principle of what the business exists for, and then watching all the different layers of purpose that come in underneath that, and all the different behaviours and the organisational sort of belief system, um, which sort of has come, you know, it, it, it's sort of been romanticised in this Silicon Valley kind of corporate culture, but the, um, all the way down to don't pay for advertising, um, do everything ethically, like the the new model of business, which um, again, not saying that they're um, that Elon Musk is a saint, um, and, and there's certainly issues there, but from a, a very very strong lead vision through to a, a company structure and the way the whole business works, 
you know, again, it's got the fortune of being a new thing that popped up and that doesn't have to have the legacy laws of, of how old car companies are structured and so on. But having seen that, you know, it's, it's truly inspiring and it's no surprise mm. to me, having seen the inside and seen the outside of the business, that it's achieving what it is. And, um, and you know, scandals will come and go, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that that's a business and a brand that will, in 10 years' time, um, you know, will be gobbling up car companies and, um, and, and going a long way. Mm. Any ads still? Yeah, it's a, look, it's a, it's a big and tricky question and I won't um, hang on it for too long except to, to say one of the industry sectors we've been working in and we've got certainly got a few people um, from here t today from that is um, in education and, and tertiary sector and you know, I've been um, yeah, thoroughly engrossed and, and, um, and impressed by the dedication of um, uh, some of the, the clients that we've been working with, yeah, particularly in the higher education sector, around looking at sh you know, shared value Think about the transformation that's going on in the industry of you know um, higher ed, you know around um, trying to fuse together universities and students and industry um, around a massively changing workforce in terms of um, you know what what we think are the jobs of the next ten and twenty years. So seeing um, you know um, organisations like Swinburne who are you know, generally trying to grapple with how we fuse together those the competing um, and complementary needs of those those three groups and recognising the big changes that need to go on internally to sort of try and mirror to that. So um, we know that that's a, a big challenge and a continued piece of work, but that concept of being able to look at our broader environment that we look in uh, and that we work in is is something that's um, a huge challenge, but um, I'm super impressive as a, as a, as a, as a, an absolute need for our for our education of our, our kids and and um, and teenage adults, you know. So yeah, so that's perhaps a little reflection on something I've seen that's a big challenge, but I'm seeing people lean into, you know. Mm. Cool. Thanks, Dill. So we might take that as a cue to pause for a minute. Now what we're going to do is take five to ten minutes each. Um, so we're going to turn back to our groups and have a quick chat about what are some of the things that we've heard this morning, what are the ideas that resonated, uh, what are some potential questions you'd like to ask, and in about five to ten minutes we'll have roaming Natasha around, one of our awesome colleagues with mic in hand, um, and she'll be able to field those. So take a few minutes now and we'll regroup in about five to ten minutes. What's the link between purpose and, and success? If success is just is that just about profit and growth and financial success? Um, we are obviously from the arts sector, and I think Tracy's stat was one percent of productions are actually profitable. But does that mean we're unsuccessful? Because there's no doubt we're purpose led. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a really interesting interesting point you raise, and and um, the where it's easy is where you make money by achieving broader social objectives, and where those two things align. But you're absolutely right. Not we shouldn't go through the 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 sort of um, the ASX 200 and slash every business which. Um, you know, doesn't have that perfect intersection, and I think we shouldn't go through society and look at look down on organisations who haven't attached a revenue model that equally aligns with their cultural value. And I think um, I think that's a very live question as a society-wide. Um, you know, how do we how do we value beyond just what we purchase, and how can we and, and um, you know whether it's arts funding or whether it's um, you know social social causes and and not for profits, how do we quantify that value? Um, mm. And, and I think you know, I would I would imagine that the challenge now for those for organisations in those spaces is you've got way more inputs now. Like I would imagine, be able to survey a community in a uh, around your organisation, and there'd be some quantifiable data that maybe you don't even have now. You know, um, and I think you know, again, I come back to to data being the thing that could wreck us or the thing that could save us, um, and, and I think the more we can, uh, and not see data, when you say data it sounds geeky, but I think, you know, quantifying, data is just a vehicle for quantifying things. And you can quantify money pretty easily because, you know, it counts itself. But how do you sort of quantify softer metrics? I think that's the kind of key question, you know, at a society level. Applicant, there was lots, lots of talk in our group about your amazing example from Keep Cup about being challenged in your decision making about, you know, um, offshoring um, manufacturing. Uh, and we were talking about the things that need to be true for that to happen. So you need to have a leader who listens yeah. and an employee who speaks up. I wonder what other things need to be true for that to happen so people can keep themselves on track with purpose. Uh, yeah, I, th I think what the, the, one of the nice things about 
one of the difficult things for people speaking up in an organisation is, you know, you could have this many ideas and what, what as a leader, you have to say no to, to a lot of things in order to, to keep a forward momentum. So articulating a purpose and a strategy so that people can come to you with ideas that, you know, have a, a good chance of success means that you get, you get a better... Is that making sense? You get a better comms loop because people are coming with ideas that might get up because they understand what you're trying to achieve. So I think that's one of the things. Um, and I think it's also about the different methods of communication you have within your team. So can people just rock up to your desk and, and spitball an idea or ha how, how do people present ideas and, and, ha and also having informal networks within your organisation. So there might be a formal way to say, I've got this idea, but also it's good to be able to go up to John and go, I've got this idea, what do you think Abby's going to think of it? So you've got a bit of a, a test bed. So, yeah, that's some of my ideas about how. how. Um, this might be for, well, for anyone on the panel. I, I, was, I love the model of the, the legacy business versus the, the new emergence, etc. And I suppose I've generally worked in legacy businesses. Um, without necessarily naming names, other than, you know, the, the visionary CEO, what are the other factors of, of, of bootstarting the transition out of legacy into the, the new thing? What are the common themes of success? Yeah, really good question. Um, I, think, I think that the, the challenge is, so if you, if you imagine the, the, um, the corporate structure inside of, let's just, this, this characterised legacy business, um, whose role is it to think beyond... Um, the the P and L for for this year, um, and you know that might be the board, and the board might be by nature conservative themselves. What tends to happen, and the and the the model that we see is that there needs to be some element of someone needs to stand up, and someone needs to um, uh, basically follow that model of gathering gathering the like minded and the willing, um, and causing a revolt. You know, to some degree, there needs to um, there needs to be some element of um, attack from within, traditionally, and that's what I've seen, um, because that's that's how things change. Like that's how things change at a human level, and so I mean we've seen um, you know we've been part of some some really successful transitions where um, some people gather together, and, and when I say attack from within, this is not this is not um, you know in any way sinister, but really um, sharing a, a, an idea around purpose and sharing a vision for the business gathering like-minded people and then going about um, laying the business case, laying the emotional language around why we should do it. Um, and, you know, uh, typically these things take a very long time to transition. But I think when, uh, you know, when there is a quorum and, and really I, I see the startup as the, the model, right? Like startups are, the, startups are easy. You get, you get one person who starts it, you bring people around. Um, that that essential structure, I think, is um, is what needs to replicate in a corporate f sort of format for that to be effective. Mm. Yeah, maybe just an add I'd have to that. Um, I think it's a really good question. But one, one of the things we've seen a lot, and we've done a lot of work with, with and do do a lot of work with legacy business, if that's a mature organisation that's um, perhaps needing to find the next thing, one of the big challenges, one of the clients we've worked with for about four or five years now going through that transition has been Horizon Power, who are... You know, um, WA, they um, cut off um, or separated from Western Power. You know, they're a utility company. You know, they've been stable for a long period of time. But, you know, massive change happening in that industry around microgrid technology and all of this sort of stuff, which, which um, you know, fundamentally changes um, not just what they do, but how they do it, the markets they operate in. And the big challenge that, that they've had and uh, is really trying to think of the, their organisation as like an ambidextrous organisation around having multiple different clients needing to innovate on one, one, one side, but also to continue to maintain the core. They still do a lot of work for the community. Australia Post, we've got a lot of friends in here from Australia Post who had the same challenge, you know. Um, we still need to do the mail and we've still got traditional services, but we're trying to transition to a new business. So some of the more practical things that, that we've seen as our organisations, even just in their practical structure, how do we give licence to a, a part of the organisation to think about new, um, to create um, perhaps uh, a new a value proposition for a different type of workforce, but at the same time being aligned to purpose. And I guess that brings us back to the, the, the point of purpose is that 
there can there, there are different extrapolations of culture in in, in organisations, but how do they still sing the same song around purpose? I think is a is an interesting one. So we, we've definitely seen that, and it, yeah, the the fixes um, definitely can have some strong structural overtones to them as well. Um, be, otherwise, it becomes very difficult to pull everyone along in the same direction when we're doing fundamentally different things. Mm. Yeah, that's, I, mean, I think the the. The business model, and I, and I kind of go to this simulator startup idea as a, as a microcosm, which is you need market feedback and you need team feedback on hyperdrive. Mm. And, and what you find, I think, is when, you're, when the intent of that breakaway, you know, if, if that breakaway group or that breakaway idea within a business, if the intent of that goes to a universal human truth, mm. it spreads like wildfire. Mm. It's not hard to sell a good idea. If the intent of that is I've got to, you know, it's, it, it, it lacks that human, um, that human angle, then it's very difficult for that to spread. Mm. I think I'm mic'd up. We just wanted to say a big um, thank you to our panel. So could we just have a, a final round of applause for our panel? Thank you for your time. <laughs>